When I was in third grade, I used to always watch this series called Any Day Now. It was this ongoing story about two little girls who were best friends, and I loved it. And one day, in one of these episodes, one of the girls got her period. So I asked my mom, who was next to me on the couch, what a period was. And my mom kind of put on her embarrassed face and replied. But here's the thing. I already knew what the period was. I had been feeling really guilty about knowing, and also about knowing that my mom doesn't know that I know. I wanted her to explain it to me herself, so that I would know that she now knows that I know. And this became a pattern. I would always tell my mom stuff I would hear about. Who got her first kiss? Who was having sex in the school bathroom? Which boy was beating his girlfriend in the school bathroom? Whose photo got leaked online uh, showing her perform oral sex on an ex-boyfriend? Etc., etc. I had lots to share, and I was giving my mom cues so that she would know what I know. The first myth I want to tackle today is that all kids will do that. That all kids, if they have questions, will naturally go to their parents and ask them. Because let me tell you, most won't, and some will ask me online. I run this uh, video online platform called Sexul versus Barza, Sex versus the Store. Se Sorry, that was German. <laughs> uh, uh, sex versus the Store camp, yeah. and I want to share with you for the second myth, which is that uh, it might be too early to have the sex talk with your kid. Another question that I got from a little girl who was nine, smart little girl, excellent internet skills, uh, a few spelling mistakes, but she's nine. She just wants to know stuff about her body and the link between body weight and uh, pubic hair. So my question is, is it too early to give her the answer that she's asking for? not according to the World Health Organization. The European uh, office developed the sort of standards for sexual education in Europe. And they also developed this very complex uh, table they call a matrix that establishes what age-appropriate sexual education should look like. And I want to share with you what uh, sexual education should look like for four to six-year-olds. Now, I told you that the uh, program I run is called Sex versus the Stork, so I'm especially pleased by the fact that they would say that myths that say that babies are brought by the stork should be dispelled. Myth number three. We use this sort of stories about the stork because we tend to think that kids and teens cannot handle information about sexual uh, education responsibly. I want to share with you this moment of very bitter serendipity from a couple of weeks ago when I got, simultaneously, I got two uh, pieces of news in my inbox. The one talking about parents in Suchava protesting against sexual education, and the other one, a news about the 17-year-old in Arad who gave birth into a toilet, and her baby died. Now, we could write that off to, oh, irresponsible teenager, or we could just make the link to the lack of sexual education. Because let me tell you, sexual education would have told this particular teenager that in Romania, if you're 16 or older, you can get, on your own, you can get uh, confidential medical advice. And I also want to make the link in this other way by showing you this graph from the World Health Organization, which shows that in Finland, in times where there were no sexual education programs or reduced sexual education programs, teenage birth rates and teenage abortion rates increased, and they decreased when there was sexual education. In Romania, there's almost no sexual education in schools. So what does that mean? It means that Romania has the highest birth rates in adolescents in Europe. 18,000 Romanian girls under 19 gave birth in 2014, and 660 of them were under 15. But let's let the girls to the side for a little bit 
and talk about the boys, because I have the feeling we tend to think the boys like, don't need sex ed. Boys don't need sex ed because they instinctually know how sex stuff plays out, play out because they're real men, and real men just know. But boys also have questions. Boys are vulnerable, and boys are really, really pressured by, <laughs> by this sort of mold of masculinity which is put upon them. And I think this mold is especially hard to navigate for some of the boys who are gay. I also think that, you know, sexually transmitted infections, STIs, don't care about your gender or sexual orientation. They don't care if you're a boy or a girl. And this graph from the World Health Organization shows that in Estonia, because or thanks to sexual education, the rates of STIs decreased. Also, just teaching girls about sexual education and not teaching boys about it at all puts a lot of responsibility on girls, and it also creates unequal relationships. And I've only been talking about boys and girls, but I haven't even touched on the complexities of gender identity and the struggles that transgender youth go through in Romania, because they also need support and they're very, very invisible. I want to go now to myth number five. Myth number five is that sexual education is vulgar. I did a poll uh, among my Romanian Facebook friends recently and asked them, is it possible that your lingua franca for sex is English? And they said, some of them said, yeah, this is a thing. We speak in English when we have sex, even though we're Romanian. Isn't that weird? Because, I mean, it is a bit weird, right? But they said Romania, Romanian is either too clinical or too vulgar, so they won't use it. They thought there was like no middle ground in Romanian for talking about sexuality stuff. And sexual education should use words like uh, penis or vulva or clitoris, which sound a little bit clinical, but... Um, were not used to these words because not even doctors in Romania use them. I have last count on the amount of uh, times where doctors in Romania have called my vulva plus vagina all in one pasarica, <laughs> which is the Romanian word for pussy. I'm also aware that I'm kind of shooting my own argument by saying uh, all of this in English, by saying that there is a, middle, a linguistic middle ground for sexuality and sexual education in Romanian, but the lingua franca in my work normally is Romanian. So I'm going to switch to Romanian for a little bit. Știu că este greu pentru noi să ne imaginăm care ar fi vocabularul pentru educație sexuală. Dacă nu ne putem imagina care ar fi vocabularul pentru educație sexuală, nu ne putem imagina care ar fi vocabularul, care ar fi tonul pentru educație sexuală. Dacă nu ne putem imagina care ar fi tonul pentru educație sexuală, nu ne putem imagina în ce fel ea s-ar purta. Va fi a vulgară, va fi a prea clinică. Tonul este acesta, iar educația sexuală este o discuție continuă și inteligentă despre sexualitatea noastră și despre teme conexe. Back to English and also to my last myth that I detest most. I've heard this a zillionth time. I've heard it said with a sort of disdain towards my supposed perverted intentions with uh, sexual education. I've heard it said with a sort of, oh, you're a kid, we're adults kind of arrogance. I've heard it said with the school urban hipster irony. We didn't have all this sex ed stuff, and we turned out okay. No, you didn't. <laughs> we didn't. Look, if you are in your early 50s now, like my mom, you grew up in this really toxic uh, political climate in Romania, in a di dictatorship, there, a time during which abortions were illegal, a time during which uh, the population's sexuality was being controlled by the state. You missed out on the sexual revolution and all the conversations that it entailed, especially the conversation about sexual education. 
If you're a part of my generation, if you're in your 20s, or if you're in your 30s, you got no sex ed from your mom, you got no sex ed from school, and yeah, you're not okay. We did not grow up in this toxic environment of a dictatorship, and abortion became legal after 1989, but being gay remained illegal up until, up until 2002, and transgender people deal with legal and medical issues in their day-to-day -day life. Also, 50% of Romanian women don't use modern contraception, and also 31% of Romanian women over 51 said that they have experienced gender-based violence, which means that Romanian men are violent to Romanian women. We're not okay. Maybe we had like a lot of trial and errors. Maybe we got lucky, found a nice partner, got to have nice sex. Maybe we didn't. Either way, we know to our core why sexual education is so important. Because it gives young people this very important information about this very important part of what makes us, us humans, which is our sexuality. Thank you.